big D's entertainment rankings and reviews. <laughs> Greetings, my fellow YouTubers, and welcome to Big D's entertainment rankings and reviews. My name is Duel, better known to y'all as the Big D. And today, of course, is Friday the 13th, and today I will, of course, review Friday the 13th. Now, although I was going to say for its anniversary next year, but I thought it probably wouldn't be worth it, so I just thought go on with it. But I did get a little suggestion by some friends on here saying I should go on and review them. So, that's what I'm going to do. So, I'm going to review Friday the 13th first. Now, I, I'm not wearing my... Jason hockey mask I got a couple months ago because Jason's not in this. Don't have the hockey mask yet, so enough said. Anyway, I just finished rewatching this. This has become one my absolute favorite horror flicks, alongside others like Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween, which this came out a couple years after Halloween was pretty big. The film was originally released by Paramount here in the U.S., while Warner Brothers released it internationally. The film was produced and directed by Sean Cunningham, who was best known for working on Wes Craven's cult classic suspense horror flick, The Last House on the Left. Anyway, the film, of course, tells the story of a group of teenage counselors who are murdered one by one by an unknown killer while attempting to reopen an abandoned summer camp. So anyway... <laughs> well... I will tell you, it was May of 1980 when the film first came out. Now then... If you've not seen this movie... And you watch this movie whole way through, you've been warned. So I'm gonna give you five seconds to stop this video and watch the and don't stop this video, okay? You got five seconds to stop this before I review this, because this is the whole thing. Here we go. Okay, here we go. You've been warned though. It was 1958 at Camp Crystal Lake when we encounter two counselors, Barry and Claudette. They sneak inside a storage cabin to have a little S-E-X. <laughs> Where an unseen assailant murders them. Yes. And what have you. And then we go into our tile card. Yeah, I love when the load comes in and the glass breaks. Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite moments of this movie and what have you. I also absolutely do enjoy this film for its music, which was composed by Harry Manfredini. Great composer for this series. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway. Now, of course, after we get our credits, our opening credits anyway... Uh, 21 years later, a, a young lady named Annie is given a lift halfway to, well, to the, to the reopen Camp Crystal Lake by a truck driver whose name was Enos, despite an elderly man's warning. And that elderly man was Crazy Ralph. You're going to camp blood, aren't you? Mm-hmm. You'll never come back. It's got a death curse. <laughs> yeah, Crazy Ralph is a prob probably a memorable character from this movie. Uh, well, while he's driving, Annie, Enos tells Annie about the past and and that her boss, Mr. Christie, tell well, well about Mr. Christie and stuff like that. Tells her to quit, but she can't. About um, a boy drowning in 1957. The two murders in 58 and then several fires after that. And the water got poisoned in 62. After being dropped off, she's off to get pick, try and make her way forward to camp. And now we go and see three other people driving, and we hear this kind of a country music sound, well, 
track and what have you, an instrumental one. I think some people just probably aren't thrilled with hearing something like that. I can understand, but yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, we they drew like past this big house with a barn and what have you. <laughs> anyway, we meet three other characters, which are Marcy, let's see now, uh, Jack and Ned. And he drives, and, he, and Ned's driving them to Camp Crystal Lake, and there they meet with the big guy, Steve Christie. And then meets his two our, well, workers, scouting Alice, and, and, well, a friend of hers, sort of a boyfriend, sort of. I kind of think she, he's her boyfriend, um, named Bill. Well, apparently, they are trying to refurbish the cabin and the facilities. And well, a thunderstorm's approaching, uh, and Steve leaves them to stock supplies and what have you. So, meanwhile, so Annie is found another person coming down the road and, and wants to go to Camp Crystal Lake. But once this Jeep she's in goes by, she's wondering if she better turn around, but don't we hit, soon get into this intensifying music. Kind of sounds like you're hearing an alternate version of the Jaws theme and what have you, but really good. And apparently catches up where even after she loses her balance but the mysterious killer comes out slashes their throat yep it happened so all of the all the others are enjoying their time and what have you even though they're still expecting any but you know Ned, of course, is being like a total crazy person, what have you. Especially when uh, this uh, police officer comes by and... Yes, and... He's not thrilled with Ned's being there and what have you. And and he's thinking that uh, Jack's been smoking dope and what have you. Yeah. Don't smoke. Gives you cancer. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, he's been lo looking for Crazy Ralph. Well, soon they, they learn that they soon, after that cop's gone, they, Alice actually encounters Crazy Ralph in the, 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 the pantry. Uh, says, God sent me. Leave this place. You're doomed. You're all doomed. He gets on his bike and leaves. So apparently, as the thunderstorm approaches, is um, Jack and Marcy are together, and oh yeah, I almost forgot one of the air counselors when me, Brenda, who Ned kind of actually likes and kind of shells of him forever. What have you? <laughs> well, apparently, he sees a mysterious figure walk to one of the cabins. So, like, can I help you? And enters in the cabin, and we don't hear much of anything. He did, and not that we don't even hear anything. So. Jack and Marcy head to what was the cabin that I believe Ned was in and soon start to have a little S-E-X. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. They're unaware of Ned's body who's above them and all. Meanwhile, Brenda decides to play strip Monopoly with Alice and Bill. Yeah. Anyway, and so they're off to go and I'm um, doing that, but anyway, I'm trying to, to 
Thank you, sorry. I did rewatch this. I'm just trying to get to clean them out of my mind while checking my source. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, well, Marcy had to go to the can, so she leaves Jack, and, well, he finds a, a joint, lights it up, starts to smoke it, and then a bit of blood falls on his head, and then soon from um, uh, arm grab the hand grabs his head and a piercing arrow tip goes right through his throat and blood starts spewing out. Yeah, that's kind of more of the stuff you see in the special uncut version, which I have on DVD. Yes, there's an uncut version featuring a few seconds of additional bloody gory footage that was not featured in the actual theatrical cut. Only a second after that, Marcy's trying to get herself prepared and what have you, and soon believes that Jack or someone else is following her and to the bathroom, and so she checks after she fixes herself up at the sink and what have you. She checks the showers and what have you. One shower doesn't see anything in the other one. It's like, must be my imagination. And then from out of nowhere, a shallow figure with a big X. <sighs> yeah. Ooh, that is going to hurt, my friends. Right in the face. So, the storm gets even more worse, causing the strip monopoly to be ended. Well, to be ending right now. So, Brenda leaves and... Soon, they, well, Alice and Bill are gathered and what have you. And meanwhile, Mr. Christie is enjoying a little bit of a, they're at the cafe and is preparing to head on back and what have you. So, hmm, let's see. Oh, yeah, and. And soon he gets picked up by the local sheriff. And drive, drive him back to the camp and tell him that Crazy Ralph was there. Anyway, Brenda hears a mysterious child's voice calling for help and ventures outside into this here pouring rain. Right to the archery range where the lights turn on and we hear a scream after that. So anyway, meanwhile, at, the sheriff brings Steve back, and he rushes over and sees a mysterious light, and recognizes the unseen killer. He's like, "Oh hi, what are you doing, on Elizabeth?" And gets stabbed. Yep. So Alice and Bill are worried and what have you, so they decide to go look for the others. And soon they find the axe that killed Marcy in Brenda's bed. The phones have been disconnected and the cars are inoperable. Soon the power goes out and Bill goes to check the generator. Alice heads out to look for him to check on stuff, but soon she finds his body pinned to the door with arrows, uh, well, on the door to the generator room. She flees to the main cabin to hide, only to be traumatized further when Brenda's body is thrown through the window, and soon after Alice sees a vehicle pulls up, it turns out to be the Jeep we saw earlier. She rushes out. She thinks it's Steve, but she is greeted by a male-aged woman who uh, I'll mention. Her. She's just traumatized. She's like, who are you? And and she's like, well, I'm, I'm Mrs. Voorhees, an old friend of the Christie's. Yes, this was Pamela Voorhees. Well, sh She's not afraid of anything. When she comes to see the massacre that occurred, she's not happy with it. And she explains 
to Alice what happened about young, the young boy who drowned in 57. It was her son, Jason. Yes. She was a cook on the when he drowned and what have you. And those counselors were supposed to be watching him because he wasn't a very good swimmer. Uh, so, she soon reveals herself to be the killer. And it's like, look what you did to him. Look what you did to him! And goes after Alice, speaking a little kiddish looking Kids sound voice. Kill her mommy. Kill her mommy. Don't let her get away. I won't, Jason. And soon she goes after her. But soon she knocks her out. Managing to hide from her at times. But soon gets caught in the act. Even in the pantry. But at the shore. Where the rowboats are. Manages Stop her again, and is ready to attempt to take her again when she finds a machete. And gains the advantage to... And ooh, that's gonna hurt. Decapitate Mrs. Voorhees. <sighs> so Alice boards and falls asleep inside a canoe, actually. Which floats down on Crystal Lake. And wakes up the next morning when two policemen arrive. One's trying to call because we don't have audible dialogue. But we do hear a pretty good um, song here. Don't know why it was... They, I think they call it like Sail Away or something. But I'm, I may be wrong though. Well, when soon she wakes, we see the corpse of Jason attack her and drag her down into Crystal Lake. Soon she wakes up. When, uh, well, not, oh, wait a minute, he's not, well, he's not a sheriff, he's a sergeant. My mistake, people. Sergeant Tierney, his name. And she is in the hospital where Sergeant Tierney's, well, there and the medical staff are attending to her. Uh, and he explains that her folks are on the way, and she's like, Is anybody else alive? Are they all dead? And he says, Yes, ma'am. Two of my men pulled you out of the lake. We thought you were dead, too. Do you remember anything else? And Alice is like, The boy. Is he dead, too? Who? The boy, Jason. Jason? In the lake, the one that attacked me and pulled me underneath. And, like, ma'am, we didn't find any boy. But, for a moment of silence, and she's like, then he's still there. And then the lake is shown at peace. And that's the end. You were warned if you may have threw out seeing this, but I am 100% sure a lot of you have seen Friday the 13th. Would I recommend it? Hell yeah! This is easily one of my favorite movies, and it's also one of my favorite movies from 1980, which that happens to be the year I was born. Yes. Anyway, the film did pretty well despite it. I kind of got mixed response from the critics and what have you. Some praised the film's cinematography, the score, and performance performances, while numerous others derided it for its depiction of graphic violence. So, this would go on to spin out numerous sequels, a 2009 series reboot, and a crossover with Frey Krueger of Nightmare on Elm Street in Frey vs. Jason. And of course, a slightly unrelated TV show as well. Anyway, please tell me what you thought about Friday the 13th from 1980 in the comments section. Like and subscribe to my channel and be a part of the Big D Nation. Join me again later on tonight when I give you a back-to-back -back review of Friday the 13th Part 2 and Part 3. Now, I will have the Jason mask on, but I will also have... 
a little something extra on there. So thank you again for watching my review of Friday the 13th. Until next time, I'm the Big D saying, see ya.